Oh, I'm sorry, just one last question. What's the fastest documented speed? What's the fastest speed ever documented, I should say, by one person that's not dead? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> that let's, hasn't died. Let's, start, let's start with the space shuttle and the rockets that it took the space shuttle up. In order to get into orbit, you've got to go 17,500 miles an hour. And we've had lots of astronauts do that. So take, take your pick. Any astronaut is. I mean, in an aircraft, let's just say F. An airplane, the fastest airplane is the SR 71. And it's a little over Mach 3, which puts it about uh, 2,200 knots, which would be about 2,500 miles per hour. Yeah. Knots are bigger than miles per hour. It doesn't take as many of them to make the same, fill up the same bucket. So it'd be a fewer number of knots, but it's the same speed. Uh, any other questions before I move on to the uh, Alpha Day Strike Force? We would run one in the morning and one in the afternoon. I've been on both of them. And the, the morning ones were kind of interesting because they begin at 2 o'clock. You get up at 2 o'clock in the morning, you go down to the squadron, go into ops, intel, and you get uh, mission planning, get your briefings done, you would talk about formations and tactics, you would talk about enemy defenses, talk about the weather, the weather was always a factor, and then there were the BLTs. And you say, yeah, have the youngest lieutenant in the flight go over to the officers club dining room and bring back a sack full of bacon, lettuce, and made sandwiches so we could all have breakfast before we went to fly. <laughs> BLTs were important. I had onion in mine, so mine was not a BLT, it was a blot, a BLOT. <laughs> uh, I mentioned some of the other airplanes that supported the mission. Uh, there was air refueling, and we had. Uh, Yeah, uh, we had several air refueling tracks that we used. Out over the Gulf of Tonkin, there was three of them. And then over uh, Thailand and Laos, there was uh, kind of about the other day, I think it was 13 over here. So there was a bunch of them. I wanted to focus on the one right over Yukon where I was stationed. Uh, it was called Blue Anchors. I think the ones out in the, in the Gulf were like uh, Orange Anchor and Green Anchor. And then we had Brown Anchor and they all had a, were named by colors. It's that Snoopy business again, you know, you got to yeah, call them something. Absolutely. But uh, I have a story I want to tell you about the Blue Anchor. One night, uh, I was not flying, it was a Sunday, and I was not on the flying schedule. So I went into town to, to have some chow and pound the bricks a little bit. And on the way back on the bot bus, bot bus, they called it a bot bus because it cost a bot to ride. Bot is worth, or was then worth about a nickel. But on the bot bus coming back to the base, uh, the rumor was spreading that we had lost an airplane. And so when I got back on base, I hustled down to the squadron to try to get the detail of it because if it was out of my squadron, I would probably one of my butts. Come to find out, Machete Flight had been up on a night mission over in, uh, I think, Pac 1 or Laos or someplace. And when they came back, there were thunderstorms sweeping across the base. I mean, one right after the other. And so they, the, the guys were forced to shoot instrument approaches. You couldn't just come in and pitch out the land with a weather like that. So uh, the number one guy, uh, the aircraft commander was a buddy of mine called, named Phil Guy, who was a major. In his back seat was my tall, skinny pick, guitar picking buddy, Luther Carver. I pointed him out to you yesterday in the picture. So they're shooting a GCA, and about five or six miles out on final, for whatever reason, they get too low, and they just pancake in the dirt in the jungle. The airplane flips over on its back and just clears out about uh, 200 yards worth of freeway. And uh, in the front cockpit, Phil was kind of dazed. In the back cockpit, Luther found himself sharing his little cockpit with a fully inflated three-foot rubber dinghy. The thing had inflated when the airplane crashed. But he got the canopy breaker tool, which is like a big stubby knife, and punched holes in it to deflate it. And as luck would have it, there was a big hole in his canopy, so he climbs out. And he hustles up to the front canopy, and there's a smaller hole in Phil's canopy. So Luther kicks it bigger, drags Phil out, and Phil begins to kind of recover again. And they hustle back up this freeway they just built, in case, you know, they didn't want to be close by if the airplane burnt or exploded or anything like that. And uh, Luther was kind of a religious boy from the Deep South. And he says, sir, I don't know about you, but I think I'm going to have a word of prayer. That was the shady flight. 
Meanwhile, Machete 2 is still trying to get down to the runway through all those thunderstorms. And he makes about three tries at it, and he can't, and now he's getting critical of fuel. And uh, command post calls him up and says, hey, we've got a, a, a tanker up in blue. Just pop up there and get a full tank of gas, and you've got some options. So he gets in touch with GCI, that's the radar guys that, that control the rendezvous with the fighters and the tankers. And uh, GCI says, hey, we got you three miles behind the tanker. And about two weeks later, he says, oh, made a big mistake. You're 50 miles on the trail. Well, by this time, Don Brown has 700 pounds of gas in his tanks. And that's enough to run the airplane for about five minutes. So he says, I'm going to make one more try at it. And if, if, uh, if we don't make it this time, we're just going to punch out. So he did. He pulled the throttles back and Max glide here, saving all the fuel he can. And this time, he gets it on the runway. And uh, since it's a wet runway, he takes the cable. The Air Force got a big hook on the tail that uh, was put there by the Navy, and the Air Force made good use of it. I've engaged the cable many times myself that hook. So he engages the cable, gets disengaged, turns off onto the taxiway, and both engines up land for fuel starvation. They just made it. But it was nice to have a, a, a tanker track up, up over your view. Here's a picture of the tanker that you had for. Oh so yeah. Explain how they do that. Yeah, this this could this looks to me a lot like uh, part of the Alpha Strike package. And these are F-105s, and you can just make out a stick of bombs on the belly, probably uh, five or six 750-pound bombs. And there's one, two, three, four. It's two flights of four on this particular tank. And what you do, you just run the with a tanker in that big horseshoe racetrack pattern, and uh, then one by one, the airplanes pull up, and uh, the boomer, the guy operating the boom in the back of the KC-135, plugs the uh, pipe into, uh, into the air refueling receptacle. i got a song about that, too. It's called Pull the Boom from the Gas Hole. And uh, it take turns, and everybody tops off their tanks, and then they go on up, strike the target, and uh, coming back, uh, they use a lot of gas to do that. So coming back, they have post-strike refueling as well, so they have enough gas to get back home, back over in Thailand. This was likely out over uh, over the Gulf of Tonkin, although it could have been over Laos. Thank you. How saying. much gas did a fueler hold on average? The, the a, a, absolute maximum. The F4? No, the no, tanker. The tanker. A, a, absolute oh, geez, maximum. I don't know. Uh, I would say 100,000 pounds plus. I don't, don't quite know how much. And, and another interesting gee whiz number, that when that gas comes down the pipe into your, your uh, fueling receptor, your fueling receptor, it transfers at the rate of 2,000 pounds a minute. Yeah. Um, I once read that the F-105 suffered some of the greatest losses in Vietnam of any aircraft that served there. I have a good buddy who flew with that. It was called the, the Thud. I got a song about that. I'll sing it for you tomorrow. I'll tell you yeah, more. I remember you saying that last year. Yeah. Um, Irv Levine, he's another one of my picking and grinning buddies. But he flew F-105s out of one of the bases in Thailand, and he said at one point they were running about a 60% casualty rate. Here, here's a preview of one of the jokes you're going to hear tomorrow. Uh, in Thailand, the uh, epitome of optimism was a thud jockey that quit smoking because it was hazardous to his health. <laughs> okay, in addition to the tankers, we had uh, SAR. I'll do that slide on oh, this another refueling. So, search and rescue. Let's say you go up there and you got your butt shot down. And you had to punch out. There you are, hanging in a tree. And the rescue forces, which were usually stationed up just a little bit north of my base in Thailand, up in northeastern Thailand, called the Khan Phanam, known affectionately as Naked Fanny. Uh, these guys lived up there. They were about as close to the battle area as you could get and still be in a secure location. The uh, A-1 Sky Raider, this is an A-1E, the Navy had some A-1Hs, and the way you can tell the difference from an A-1E to an A-1H, the A-1H has got a little bubble canopy on it, like an F-16, but this thing had, you were living practically in a greenhouse in the A-1E. But they would go in, locate the survivor, and if there were any defenses around, they would suppress them. The A-1 could stay up for eight plus hours, and he could, he could haul a ton of stuff on those wings. He could haul napalm, uh, they could put mini guns out there, uh, cluster bombs. He could carry hard bombs, 500 pound bomb, like that. And uh, once they kind of sterilized the area where the survivor was, they would call in the CH-53 helicopters. 
known as the Jolly Green Giant. And the Jolly Greens would come in and uh, drop a cable down to the survivor, kind of like a, a fan type seat on it, and you climb on that seat, strap yourself to the cable, and lift you up the helicopter and everybody take off. There's uh, several really exciting stories about uh, rescue efforts that were made, some of which were successful and some were not. Anybody ever seen the movie Flight of the Intruder? That's a story about a rescue. You get a chance to see it. It's, it's Navy, but the procedures were about the same in the Air Force. And there was another one called Bat 2 1. And the story of Bat 2 1, uh, he was flying in an EV 66 electronic warfare uh, twin engine bomber. And it got shot down. And this guy's uh, name was, uh, his last name was Hamilton. I can't remember his first name. Or his nickname. His first name was Iseal, I C E A L. And the call sign of that airplane was Bat 2 1. They get shot down and they make a huge effort to try to get him out. And it took, I think, like a week or something like that. And we lost a lot of other airplanes, a lot of other people trying to rescue this guy. Uh, okay, so that's SAR. Uh, in your textbook on page 242, there's, a, there's an error, and I'll point that out to you in just a minute. Just before I got over there in uh, Thailand, in, I got there in September, well, back in January of 1967, uh, we were taking an awful lot of hits. We were, we were losing a lot of F-105s and a lot of other airplanes, too. Part of the problem was we, we went up the same way every time, either up the water side or the land side, and then into uh, the Hanoi area. There's not too many variations you can put on that. Plus, we had some very strict guidance from the people in the White House and the Pentagon people who didn't know their butt from third base about how to run a war. And so we had to do it their way, and it cost us a lot of people. So one day, Colonel Robin Owens, who was the wing commander at Yuban, says, here's what we're going to do, boys. We're going to load up a bunch of F-4s with missiles and guns, and we're going to use F-105 call signs. We're going to use bomber call signs, and we're going to go up there, and when the MiGs come up, we're going to give them the surprise of their life. And that's exactly what happened. It was called Operation Bolo, and uh, we shot down seven enemy MiGs that day. Uh, the mistake in your book, it says that uh, Colonel Chappie James led that flight. Chappie was a great guy. I knew him personally, and I also knew Robin personally. But he was not in charge of that flight. Robin Owens led that flight. Yep. Um, Operation Bolo shot down seven MiG-21s. Wasn't that about half the MiG-21s in our fate? I don't know how many they had, but uh, they would have knocked a big dent in it. And when they were all MiG-21s, I wasn't aware of that. I, I read that they only had like 16, 21s at that time. Well, that knocked me over, didn't it? Uh, then there was the... Oh, this is, this is Colonel Olds. Right after Bolo, he gets back and he's riding into the op shack on the shoulder of these guys, smoking a nasty cigarette. This guy named Bill Kirk, he wound up wearing four stars. He was a guy that retired me. Uh, you saw my retirement picture yesterday. Dick Davis, he was the guy who went to Route Pack 6 the first time and told me that all those sparkies on the ground were uh, 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 muzzle flashes. <laughs> and Skip Wyrock, he was an A-flight. I don't know what ever happened to Skip. And this guy, I, I recognize his face, but I don't remember his name. I don't know what happened to him either. That was a great day. The Dolor Bridge. There were two bridges over the Red River running through uh, uh, the Hanoi the city of Hanoi, or on the outskirts. One was the, uh, uh, what we call the Railroad Bridge, and the other one was called the Paul Domer Bridge. And the reason it was called Paul Domer Bridge was because this Frenchman named Paul Domer, D-O-U-M-E-R, was the Governor General of Indochina at one time. So they named the bridge after him. I had always thought that he was the engineer that built the bridge. Not true, he was the Governor General. But, uh, to tell you this story, I want to read you a short excerpt from one of my books. Uh, the book is uh, RBAAB, The Red Blooded All American Boy, and it tells the story of how I got chosen to go out bomb the Dover Bridge. And this was the second time around. In August of 1967, the F 105s and the F 4s went up there and dismantled that bridge with 3,000 pound, pound bombs. Well, they, it got repaired. And then uh, about I don't know, early December, the uh, 7th Air Force, which was our headquarters down in Saigon, sent the word down that we were going to have to go bomb that bridge again. 
Here's the excerpt. And the title of it is Not Being Home for Christmas. I got to the war near the end of the summer of 1967. I don't know that it dawned on me right away that there would be some possibility of leave to go back home and see my family until my combat tour was complete. But I put in for the Christmas leave anyway, and my flight command approved me. I learned something. It never hurts to ask. After the first 30 or 40 missions getting shot at and watching others get hit, the prospect of seeing my family became many orders of magnitude more meaningful. The counters kept stacking up. The counter was a mission into North Vietnam. I was on a 100 mission tour. And I got 100 missions over North Vietnam. I got to come home. Along the way, I picked up another 25 minutes. The counters kept stacking up, and I grew ever more wise in the ways of war. And Christmas was coming like a freight train. My thoughts of home, my parents, my family became ever more pointed as the holiday got closer. Then we got a frag on the Dover Bridge. Approaching mid-December, Nguyen had repaired the destruction dealt that infamous span by the Taiwan-based Thuds and Phantoms back in August. And 7th Air Force in Saigon told us we had to go back and bomb it again. Why now? Couldn't wait for a few more days? I could be high over the Western Pacific in a C-141 eastbound to the fireside of comfort, safety, and love we all dreamed about, especially at this time of year. It began